Hello, and welcome to episode 78 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Michael Grunberg, at-large member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee and principal at Grunberg Consulting. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jordan. Thanks for coming. Excellent. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Well, I, you know, again, it's, it's funny, um, being on the Central Committee is, is certainly one, but I started in politics when I was in college. Um, hmm. I was the president of the Young Democrats at my, at my college, mm-hmm. and, and I met a bunch of people who were political activists who I, I never knew those kind of folks existed. Yeah. And, um, and one guy says to me, it was over a summer, he said, why don't we, we, we there's a guy running for, for city council in New York, mm-hmm. um, he doesn't have organization backing. We like him. He's a he's a neighborhood guy. Mm-hmm. Would you want to work on the campaign? Mm-hmm. And a real estate person uh, donated a, an, an empty house mm-hmm. for the summer, hmm. and we basically ran the campaign. It was all young people. Yeah, I don't think anybody's over 20, 22 years old. <laughs> and strangely enough, the guy won, which was really amazing. Was he in his twenties as well? No, no, he was a regular lawyer. He was a lawyer. He was just a, a community activist yeah. in, in that community. And, uh, and he won. And he won, yeah. So you really had an impact as a young person. We did. We had an incredible impact. Were you surprised by the outcome? Completely. <laughs> I was shocked. I said, I don't know how this guy's going to win. And then, of course, we got a little, little cocky. Uh-huh. Uh, he became president of the city council in New York. Hmm. And then we ran him for governor. Hmm. And, and again, we ran the campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was assigned way upstate New York. I mean, mm-hmm. I was up, up near the Canadian border. Huh. But... Um, the problem was he was good, but he didn't come across well on TV. Mm-hmm. So when we bought the TV spots, he just didn't come across and he didn't win. And, hmm. and that, by that point, I'd gotten the bug to, to do this kind of stuff. And when are we talking? What decade is this? Uh, this is the um, late 60s, early 70s. So. so you found that by getting involved, you actually could have an impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did he involve you in any way on his staff? Um, I was teaching school at the time, Mm -hmm. and I really wasn't interested in being on his staff. Mm -hmm. Um, We had discussed it, because him and I became very good friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, But no, I I, I just, I didn't want to do that part of it. So your volunteer service in politics, got a, you got an early start there. Right, very early start. And and it was great, and and the young Democrats, Mm -hmm. and that's why I really love to see these uh, young people and the young Democrats, Mm -hmm. because that's really where I started. And um, um, I run, I had run for... um, President of the Young Democrats in my college, mm-hmm. then I became the vice president of the New York State Young Democrats. Oh, wow. And that was a whole campaign where we printed up literature and, and really had fun doing it and mm-hmm. actually won. So it's, uh, you know, it, was, it was great. But now you're in Maryland yes. and you've had a whole career and life in between there. Mm-hmm. So what brought you from there to here? Did you remain th- active in democratic politics throughout no, your life? No, you know, life intervened, as we like to say. <laughs> and, you know, I had to make a living uh-huh. and uh, raise, a, raise a family. And volunteering with the young Dems didn't do we that. Didn't do that. <laughs> I wish it did. Uh, and so I kind of lost, lost uh, that kind of uh, connection. And um, when I moved here, I moved here because of my company that I was working for at the time promoted me to... Uh, a very senior position, mm-hmm. and I was working out of my house in Long Island, hmm. and they said, well, we want you to do this, but you got to move here. And Mark children have grown, so it really was an easy, uh, very easy uh, decision to make. Plus, over the years, most companies I worked for were based in Bethesda, for whatever reason. Huh. I don't know how that happened. Huh. Um, and so, you know, moved down here, and, and of course, I went to vote. And I met uh, the chair person of this district, mm-hmm. and we became friendly. And she said, "You know, I need a vice chair." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Okay, I can do that." Mm-hmm. And started to get involved there, and then you know went went a little further and became uh, um, on, on the committee, on the central committee. So, so you've been, and, and you said you were a teacher, and now you're in librarian sciences. Right. How what how did how did that whole career path come to pass? Well, you know, when, when I graduated college. My, my goal was to go surfing in California. Hmm. I had no desire to work. I had no desire to do anything other than to have a good time. Hmm. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, some family emergencies dictated to me that I had to get a job. Hmm. And at that time, the, um, the job that was easiest to get was to be a school teacher in New York hmm. because they had a shortage. Mm-hmm. So if you had the prerequisite number of credits in college, you know, you, you could become a teacher. Huh. And, uh, and and so I became a teacher, and that was great. I 
I went back, I got my master's in administration, so I became a licensed principal in New York. Hmm. And literally the same day I got my principal certification, mm -hmm. which was after about six years of teaching, mm -hmm. I got a layoff notice that said, we now have a budget crisis in New York, so we're laying people off. Huh. And so I got married, I had a, you know, ready to, to start a family, all that kind of stuff. So I got a job as a salesperson. And the company was called uh, Disclosure, and they were the archivists for the SEC here in Washington. SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission right. for our and, listeners. Right. And, and they're, they're, what they were doing was taking pictures of every piece of paper filed by public companies at the SEC. Hmm. Because public companies are required to file. Hmm. And approximately, at that time, eleven to 12,000 companies. And their, the company's job was to film that information at no cost to the government. In return, we got to sell the information. So, and it was told at that time of, of the greatest advancement on microfiche, which we've all used. Uh, most this is before electronic scanners. Before, before I mean, uh, probably uh, the beginning of electronic scanners. <laughs> and so my job was to sell microfiche copies of SEC documents to libraries. And um, I got to like it. I got to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I was going to go back to teaching, but that never came, came up. I advanced myself in the company. I became mm -hmm. global VP of sales of the company. Hmm. Uh, became fairly successful there, and never looked back. So when I when I decided uh, to open my, my consulting business five years ago, mm -hmm. um, I, I decided I want to do more for your public service more. So I'm now on the Juvenile Justice Commission huh. in Montgomery County. I do work for the state's attorney's office in a truancy program. Hmm. Uh, just got involved in the sister cities program for Montgomery County. Oh wow! Plus the plus the uh, the, uh, the central committee and uh, and four grandchildren. So it's it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of interesting how that all works. It's interesting how I can see the effect that politics has had on your life throughout your life. Oh, yeah. It seems like professionally you entered teaching because of a political situation. They needed students to be taught. They had a lack of teachers. Right. Therefore, you filled that need. Then there was a budget crisis, which was in the state capital of Albany, um, a political situation where they had made different budgetary decisions, tax policy decisions, and the implications were that there were massive layoffs across the state. And that changed your, changed, pivoted your career path into library sciences and, your, and, and what led you down to, to Maryland. Right. So it's interesting to see how politics has had such an enormous impact on the course of your career, even though it has been somewhat indirect. Indirect, but you know, the thing is, what, what I, you know, and of course, as you know, I wrote a book about uh, buying and selling information. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I say in the book is you have to read the signposts along the way. You have to read the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people get so immersed in their, in their jobs mm -hmm. that may be going nowhere, mm -hmm. and it's clear to everybody around them, but not to them. So you really have to always reassess what you're doing, how you're doing it, and, and, and be able to, to pivot. Yeah. Because I read an article when I was in college that said, uh, you would, most people change careers three times in their lifetime. I've, I've done it at least three times. Yeah. And it's absolutely correct. It's, it, was, it was absolutely prophetic. That, that I, I read this and said, well, I, that's not going to happen to me, and I'm going to get a job, and that'll be it. Mm -hmm. So you really do learn, mm -hmm. and I think, again, the politics is, is always present, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that's really what kind of helped me along the way. So seeing as we are on public interest podcasts, I'd like to return the subject a little bit to kind of the elements of your career that you've used to advance the public interest on however you've seen fit, either through educating kids right. or by making information more available to libraries. How ha why is it important to make more information available from the SEC to libraries? Why is that something that would anyone would want? Why is that helpful? Well, this is part of what we, what we in our society, public company <laughs> information is vital now. I mean, it used to be kind of a deep, dark secret. Mm -hmm. um, part of what the company did, which I thought was brilliant, mm -hmm. was we created uh, handbooks mm -hmm. on what's in the documents. And part of my responsibility was to go out and speak to people about what's in a, and the, the basic document is called a 10K. Uh, and what does that refer to? 10, uh, the letter of the law. The, 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 the letter. Of a federal law? Yeah. There's a federal law requiring publicly held corporations to file their own financial documents with the right. SEC? Financial documents, suits against the company, uh, earnings of the, of the people on the board of directors, uh, planned expansion, everything that has to do with the company. Because the SEC, as you, remember, you probably don't know, but the SEC was created because of the stock market crash. 
where people were investing in all these companies. And Joe Kennedy was the first uh, commissioner of the SEC, right? Could be, yeah, I think you, you might be right. I think, yeah. And so people were investing, yeah, uh, but with no information or very very scant information. So a lot of the benefit of having this information available is because since the 1920s, there's been a proliferation across society of investments um, that many Americans, many more Americans proportionally now than 100 years ago, hold uh, stock in publicly held corporations. And what you're doing is you've been making information available to stockholders, shareholders, so that they can make better decisions on when to buy and sell of which company. Yeah. And that's somewhat analogous to our democracy and journalism, and that journals will make information available often about political systems so people can be informed voters. And here, people, instead of at the ballot box, at, when they make a trade, right. um, because it's easier to make a trade, you need more inform Is that basically... Well, you know, it, it, it started, it's, it's not like it is today, mm -hmm. where I can go to... Uh, Scott Trade or, or uh, Schwab and, and get it on my, my computer. Yeah. You know, so years ago, you didn't have that, that access to the information as easily. Mm -hmm. So we felt at the company at that time, uh, and I was with them for 20 years, so I you know, grew with the company, mm -hmm. that we had to educate the, 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 the um, population as to what's in these documents. And I used to literally go to, to uh, universities mm -hmm. um, and, and talk to the students about this stuff. Uh, business classes. I have all kinds of, uh, of, of great memories going to many schools, uh, talking to to the custom, to the kids. A lot of times, like business school libraries. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, there was a guy, um, Frank Riley, was the dean of business at, at Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and Frank and I became friends. And he said, "Mike, I'd like you to come to to the school and talk about you know what's in a 10K and what's in a proxy and so on." What's a proxy? Uh, proxy a proxy report is, is another document that's filed at the SEC, mm -hmm. and that one is very detailed as mm -hmm. to what the people on the board are being paid. Hmm. So, uh, and I was, as, as I'll come back to my Frank Riley story. So, uh, I was just in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I gave a keynote address at mm -hmm. the uh, University of South Carolina, hmm. and there were people there from the development office. Hmm. And these are people, that, and, you know, young, young ladies who did research. Mm -hmm. And their research basically says, all right, I'm looking at XYZ company. Mm -hmm. Here's Joe Blow. He's the chairman. Joe gets X amount of salary, has mm -hmm. so many stock options. Oh, by the way, you have stock options? Can you donate it to the university? Right. So, so that was the kind of information that's there, and I was really pleased to see that you know that they're doing that, uh, doing that kind of work. But mm -hmm. Riley brings me to the University of North, to Notre Dame, and he brings me to one of these big classrooms with like horseshoe uh, and kids like you know all over, and they are just shooting questions about what's in the documents, and it was really very invigorating mm -hmm. because obviously they were involved and they were interested, mm -hmm. and you know hopefully. Whatever I did that day, you know, maybe a couple of kids became, uh, you know, stockbrokers or, or understood the value of these documents. Because there's a load of information, you know, that, but, but people need to understand, you know, that, that it is accessible. Did you ever think about using this information for your own gain for you know, trading stocks or something? No, I'm not a stock trader. You know? Yeah. I, I have mutual funds and, and that's all I know. I don't, uh, but you could. We had a, we actually, we had a guy who used to buy from us, he, he would buy 8K reports. Mm -hmm. 8K reports are unscheduled material events. Mm -hmm. So if something significant happens in the company, mm -hmm. an 8K has to be filed within 15 days at the SEC. And this guy was, was basing his investments off of the 8Ks. Hmm. So, and I, I Did he do well? I think he did very well. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, ex and it was, expensive, it was an expensive uh, subscription for him, but he did very well. He's just an investor. I remember he came to the office. Uh, he was from Milwaukee. And he, he said, Mike, I, got it. I need this. And, and so that was it. That was so you said there was a story you were going to tell me um, about a uh, guy? Which a moment ago, anyways. Oh, uh, Frank Riley. Story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dean Riley. Yeah. So what about the Dean Riley? Is that, was that Dean yeah, Riley? Dean Riley brought me to Notre Dame to talk to the kids. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you've been doing a lot with, uh, with these investment reports and library sciences, and you've helped a few individuals. You've, made, you've helped individuals make better, more informed decisions. Okay. Why has that been rewarding to you? Why is that something worth doing? I was very fortunate in my life mm -hmm. to have people who mentored me at different stages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, n nothing is ever easy. You, know, you always have to work hard, and you, you know, you're, you're a prime example of that. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that I like helping people. I mean, just that's what I enjoy. I mean, there, 
in my industry, I'm in the information industry, I'm fairly well known, mm -hmm. and I will get calls very regularly about people who are looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. Mike, what do you think? You know, And I've helped people get jobs. I don't want any money for it. I don't want any mm -hmm. other than thank you. That's mm -hmm. all I look for. Mm -hmm. And I know when I had situations and people helped me, that was kind of nice. So I feel as though it's important to give back a little bit. And uh -huh. uh, whether it's you know doing the stuff with the Democrats, whether it's uh, helping um, uh, young men and women to get a better job or... Uh, tutoring or mentoring, you know, I'm happy to do that. And as I said, I was very fortunate. I had one particular person in my life who really changed my life. And, Tell uh, me about that. Um, it was <laughs> the, my company uh, president belonged to an organization called the Tech Group. And the Tech Group, and I think it's still around, was you had to be the president of your company mm -hmm. to join. Yeah. And they would meet like every month and talk about stuff that was uh, relevant to each person. So, they, well, here's my, I had this problem and here's how I solved it. And, oh, oh, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And they always would have a speaker come in. Mm -hmm. And um, my, the president of my company called me and said, Mike, I got a guy coming in. He's going to talk about sales. Mm -hmm. You should join us. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you can't stay for the lunch. The lunch is, you know, only for members. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can. So I, I went and I heard this guy and I was just, I was knocked out by the way he presented, the way he spoke, the, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And I said, i got to get this guy's number, and, and he left, and I didn't get a hold of it. I went downstairs to get a taxi back to the airport, mm -hmm. and there he was. He said, can we share a cab? I said, sure. And we shared a cab, and he, he says, can you do me a favor? Uh, my daughter's looking for work, and she's in New York. You're in New York. Can you interview her? I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. A few days later, she came in. I interviewed her. I didn't have a job for her, but he called and thanked me. And he said, Mike, anytime I can be of service to you, let me know. And I was going through a very difficult time in my personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, the company had just been sold. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of turmoil in my life. And I call him up. I say, well, what should I do? What do you think? And he said, well, here's, here's my ideas. And over the years, uh, he helped me a lot. And he was the one who encouraged me to write my book. Hmm. So God had a very profound effect on my life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I always felt, all right, if I can be helpful to other people, I'm happy to do that. So. It's kind of like uh, paying it forward in a way. Yeah, kind of, kind of. So you're involved in a truancy court? Yes. Um, you know, my, um, when I was on the um, um, Commission Juvenile Justice, mm -hmm. there was a guy sitting next to me mm -hmm. uh, who was from the state's attorney's office. Hmm. And uh, he, he comes over and he said, you know, I'm involved in this truancy program. And basically what it is is kids are truant from school. Mm -hmm. And if we can figure out why mm -hmm. and get them into school, right. that would be very cool. So I said, sure. So the way it works is there are about eight to ten kids in each school. And they're earmarked as, as classic truants. And so you bring the kid in. And so it's me. I serve as the judge or the facilitator. Mm -hmm. There's the guidance counselor. There's the person from the state's attorney's office. Mm -hmm. um, maybe... Um, a vice principal for the school, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we talked to the kid. And I said, so what's the, what's the problem? And you find it the most amazing thing. We had one kid, which I, I'm just really proud of. He was diabetic. Mm -hmm. And so every morning, mom would take a reading on his, you know, his, his blood sugar. And if it was high, she didn't send him to school. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, there's a nurse in the school. She can take the same test. And we have, you know, we can give him the medication. And mom didn't know that. Mm -hmm. said, you know, they're foreign born. Mm -hmm. So they didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. The kid now can go to school. The kid's a straight-A student, mm -hmm. made honor roll. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one little girl. Her, she had nine siblings. Mm -hmm. So mom got busy. She said, well, you got to watch your, your little sister. Mm -hmm. she said, i got to go to school. Well, no, you got to watch your little sister. Mm -hmm. So we worked something out for mom with that. So the whole program, you know, we, we graduate now out of our program, but 80% of the kids that we see, which is phenomenal, hmm. because uh, they really um, understand that we want to help them. A lot of social, medical, non-academic determinants of truancy yeah. at school. Yeah. And if you can kind of present solutions that are non-traditional, outside-of-the-box kind of solutions to these different problems, getting a babysitter for that family yeah. or letting them know about the resources for health care within the school, then that will enable a child with a special situation at home uh, to enable to get, get them to have their education. Right. It's, it's non-confrontational. Yeah. You know, and, and it's really interesting. We have 10 sessions with them. And now this is my third semester doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's, the pattern is always the same. The first one or two sessions, they're very closed. They hardly talk to you. Mm -hmm. They don't even look you in the eye. 
they kind of you know look down and, and you get one word answers. Mm -hmm. By the third or fourth, they kind of say, you know what? Maybe this is worthwhile. Maybe I could do something here. Mm -hmm. And we involve the parents. Yeah. Uh, the woman from the state's attorney calls every parent at the end of every session. Mm -hmm. Says, here's how your kid did. Here's mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been great. And that's uh, and you know who's heading that up is Phil Andrews heading that up. And who is Phil Andrews for our listeners? Phil Andrews was uh, uh, um, county council for many years here in Montgomery County. So um, as we near the end of the podcast, I'd like to ask you to reflect upon your years in helping people from being a volunteer on a campaign for New York City Council member, a gubernatorial campaign, to uh, education and teaching kids. You had library sciences where you're helping people make informed decisions about their investments so that they can provide for family. Well, yeah. Not so much investment, just research. Research, and then... Um, and then, of course, you're now volunteering on a truancy court and with the state, uh, with the Montgomery County uh, Democratic Party apparatus. And just if you could speak for a moment about your motivations and about why or if you found it rewarding and, and why it has been worthwhile to invest so much of your time um, in these non remunerated activities. We are very fortunate yeah. in the fact that we live in a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. um, I am grateful every day. For the, for the lifestyle I, I live mm -hmm. and have lived and, and enjoy it. And I feel as though people who have been fortunate enough mm -hmm. to get to uh, whatever level um, should, should give something back. I, I really believe that. I don't, I don't I think, you know, sometimes, and sometimes I see these kids in the mall and they seem so self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. And you say, you know what? You really, you know, you come from a pretty good house. You know, you're, I see the clothing you're wearing. That's pretty, you know, that's, that's not cheap stuff. Uh, we really need to give more back to our communities. I always thought, and I lived, I grew up in Queens in New York, but then when I started my, my, my sales work, I moved to Nassau County, which is an expensive county to live. I'm now in Montgomery County, which is an expensive county to live. Mm -hmm. and, and when I came here, um, I, I said, all right, well, Montgomery County is, is, is probably very affluent. Mm -hmm. In fact, is it isn't. There are two parts to, to Montgomery County. There are people that are not doing real well in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, like, for example, I'm on the board of the Noise School, which is a detention facility in, uh, in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had um, Thanksgiving. We served that Thanksgiving dinner uh, to all the kids. Hmm. <clears throat> it was all donated uh, food items. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was really great. You know, all these kids who, for want of whatever reason, made some poor choices early in their life, got, mm -hmm. got arrested and got detained. And, and, and these kids are no different than the kids I grew up with. Mm -hmm. you know, and we all, you know, I don't know about you, but we've all made some dopey decisions in our lives, mm -hmm. so, uh, and me included. So, you know, there but for the grace of God, go with I. So, you know, if we can help people, I'm all for that. And uh, hopefully that's uh, some of the stuff I can do. This Michael Groomberg, who has a profound sense of empathy and responsibility, who recognizes the gifts and benefits and advantages that he has had throughout his life, um, and merely recognizes that to whom much is given, much is expected. So uh, with all that he has, uh, he takes pleasure in and acknowledges responsibility he has to give back. And make sure that he, he honors those who's give, who have given to him by uh, perpetuating the cycle of munificence and giving to those who come after him. This has been episode uh, 78 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for coming. Good to see you. And uh, we will uh, talk to you ne next time. Thank you for listening.